Now, in another video, I talked about how to obtain polynomial models from the scatter plot graph in Excel. But for this one, I want to go a little bit more in depth as to what polynomials are in general and other ways that we can analyze them in Excel beyond just obtaining the equation and the R squared from the scatter plot. So a polynomial model typically has the form shown here where we have a single input variable really, but uh, we have different powers of that variable. Um, so we, to create a nonlinear function, uh, there is a highest degree term. Excel can only go up to degree six, but in general, um, in the scatter plot, it can only go to degree six. But in general, it could be higher. Um, it's very uncommon to use anything as high as degree six even. Um, so six is generally more than sufficient. Most of the time we're going to use quadratic and cubic models. Uh, if you have multiple variables, there, you know, multiple regression can also be nonlinear in, in a polynomial form, uh, which we'll address at some other point. But typically this one variable expression is modeled on a polynomial. And then of course there's an error term. Now, um, this, we've seen the scatter plot construct our models, but what we want to be able to do is again analyze them more completely. Um, and for that, we're going to use our data analysis tool pack. Uh, essentially, what we're going to have to do is create uh, transformations of our variables in order to do that, uh, powers essentially of our x variable. And then from there, we can. Um, treat them essentially as multiple variables. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, similarities and, and it, functionally what we're doing is we're treating it like a multiple regression model, which we do cover in another video. Um, but the polynomial model, the transformations that we need to uh, perform the analysis um, that goes beyond just constructing the polynomial in the graph is going to require us to essentially treat it like um, a multiple variable model by creating additional variables uh, for x squared for our quadratic model and an x cubed for our cubic model and so on. Now, uh, the example that we're going to do is not going to, it's going to be more typical. It's going to be, uh, we're going to use a quadratic model for it. Uh, it's actually literally built from a sine function, but it has, you know, just one arc of the sine function. And so it looks very quadratic. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna look at that and then um, build a model for it from that data, uh, and and we'll the the generalization to the cubic model and so on is is very straightforward. Now, one thing that we do sometimes have to worry about, and this shows up in different places, um, if our polynomial models are too large, our inputs the x values are too large. Um, sometimes we can create problems with overflow errors and things like that in, in the computing behind the scene. Um, if you, for instance, are using the year as your input variable, and then you try to create a quadratic model or a cubic model from that, um, the difference between 2000 cubed and 2001 cubed sometimes can run into the uh, a problem with the size of the, the values that Excel has to manage when it, I mean, 2000 cubed is a very big number. It has a lot of digits. And 2001 or 2002 cubed, the difference between that may run into sort of a memory problem. So sometimes it's necessary to transform years in these models into starting at a, 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 a different value. So instead of starting using 2000, 2001, 2023, whatever, um, shift the, the starting value. Let's say 2000 is equal to zero or 2020 is equal to zero, something like that, in order to make the X values that are going into the calculation um, smaller. And therefore, I mean, there's a big difference between Five, five cubed and six cubed um, that, ex again, it's, a, it's on an order of magnitude that Excel can easily handle, whereas uh, 2015 and tw cubed and 2016 cubed, again, it may run into those memory capacity errors. Um, and they, it may, Excel may not 
actually be able to tell the difference because the differences are way out on the end of the values. So just something to keep in mind as we go through this process. Uh, these, these shifts, these transformations, um, just subtracting a constant value from all of your X values uh, can make the model easier to work with if you, you get things that don't really make a lot of sense. All right, so let's go over to Excel. Okay, so what I've created here is a data set that uh, models essentially um, looking at the moon and calculating the percentage of visible surface that you can see. So if it's a full, full moon, it's 100% full. And then if it's a new moon, then you can basically see zero of it. And the moon is on like a 29 day cycle. And so, and the, 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 the actual function that models this is a sine function, um, but we're not gonna worry about that here um, because instead um, we're, we're, we wanna build a, we don't have sine, sine as it turns out is actually not a function that you can easily uh, compute uh, in the, the same way that we would compute all of these other uh, models using linear algebra which is a topic for another day. Um, and so we, we can't really do the sign number crunching here, but we can approximate sort of one cycle with a quadratic. And so let's actually just look at the graph and sort of confirm that this does look somewhat quadratic-like. Um, and again, we don't want the lines connecting things. There we go. So this is our day of the cycle. And this is our percent visible. And I put in a little bit of an error into these figures uh, just to make sure that, you know, maybe different people were making the estimates. And, you know, people are not necessarily always very good at eyeballing things like this. And so, um, there's there's nobody that is actually 100%. We get as close as like 99.8%, um, but that's fine. But you can see that for one cycle, we're essentially going from 0% on the new moon day to full and then back to roughly 0%. Maybe it's a very thin crescent moon. All right, so what we wanna do again is we wanna construct our quadratic model. And uh, the way that we're going to do this in, again, we're going to go through the graph again, um, but then we're going to do this more fully with transformations of variables in the um, data analysis tool pack. So we're going to add our trend line and we can see the straight line does not a very good job. And so we're going to change this to a polynomial. Our polynomial does a second degree polynomial does an excellent job. And so we're going to keep that. I'm going to move it over here. Now, what we should be able to do is obtain this same model from the data analysis tool pack. Now, I'm going to actually just look at one other example. Um, I'm going to set the constant equal to zero. And I'm not going to worry about the axis labels because it's the same graph. Um, polynomial set intercept equals zero, because this is also a possibility. And honestly, the truth is that um the new moon when it's there's nothing visible and it's completely blank no crescent you should get a zero for the intercept right um so we can in, impose that on the quadratic model in the same way that we can impose that on the linear model and so what we can do is we can then look at both of these analyses and we can see when you eliminate a, a coefficient you might get a a better or worse fit 
Um, this got slightly worse when we took away the intercept, but it's negative here. And so I just thought we would give that a try. But let's go through and do the analysis. Um, now, in order to, uh, there, because this is going to be a polynomial model, um, there are no built-in functions for this. There's no correlation. There's no slope because there's actually more than one variable as far as Excel is concerned in the problem. But the way that we can do this in the data analysis tool pack is we're going to do a transformation of our variables. And so I'm gonna make a copy of our data. And the thing that we have to be careful of is that um, the data analysis tool pack requires that our X variables be contiguous with each other. So they don't have to be in any particular order, but they do have to be together. So I can't take my, my squared X inputs, the days. I can't put one on one side and, and uh, like day on one side and then day squared on the other side. I have to have them as being next to each other. So what I'm gonna do, they can be in either order, but it makes a little more sense if they're in sort of the traditional sort of left to right order, either squared and then linear or like cubic squared and linear or vice versa, linear squared, cubic, et cetera. So for, the, for only two of them, it's not particularly important but it'll be useful in the way they show up in the problem um, that they're in a particular order. It, in this configuration, what they should show up as is intercept day, day squared order. And that's the easiest to match to our equations. Okay, so once we've set up this transformed variable for the quadratic model, this now essentially has two X inputs. And so the date, what we're essentially doing at this point is multiple regression. Now in the data analysis tool pack, it is designed to do that for us. So here's our regression and our Y values are here. And our X values are here. And again, I've highlighted both columns at the same time. Um, yes, we'll just run all of these. The output range I'm gonna put here. Maybe we'll make a 99% confidence interval this time. And then we can come back and we can try the constant to zero example. Now, when we have multiple regression, we're gonna get two residual plots because it's gonna plot the residuals against each of the input X variables. So we're gonna have a plot of against day and a plot against day squared. That's fine. Um, they both look fine from here, so that's good. Here's our R squared value. And if we go back to our graph, 99.04, and this is 99.04, so they're the same R squared values. That's great. We Now the multiple R is basically the correlation, the sort of regular linear correlation version. Uh, the multiple R is basically just the square root of the R squared. It doesn't contain any sign information unlike regular linear correlation. But if you're needing to compare one model to another, you can use the R squared or you can use the multiple R, but it's essentially the multiple variable version of correlation. Um, and then here's our intercepts and our, our coefficient values. And again, we can sort of look at these uh, in comparison to our previous values. Um, our intercept is negative, point, negative three point stuff. And here's our day. Now the day coefficient is the coefficient of the X coordinate, that's our 13. And then the day squared value here 
is um, the coefficient of the x squared in our equation. So that's here, and you can see that's negative. And it makes sense that it's negative because that parabola is upside down. And then we can look at all of our p-values, again, perform our traditional hypothesis testing. The model overall looks good. Something in the model is, being is doing the explanation. Um, the x squared, this definitely looks like a good quadratic model. The coefficient of the x squared term is very low. The coefficient of the linear term is also very low. The p-value on the intercept is above 0.05. And so what that's suggesting to us, in fact, is that we should remove this from the model as I suspected. Um, so let's go ahead and do that analysis. I don't have to change anything except this and where the output is going to print out. And I'll try and put this over here. Who knows what's going to happen to my residual graphs? Um, and again, just make so that they're not kind of in the way. I'm going to take them off. So they don't appear in strange places. Now let's again, let's our R squared value went down a little bit. Um, in the graph, 0.9898, but it actually went up in our um, data analysis tool pack output. Um, so that's interesting. Um, our coefficients, they hardly changed. Day and day squared hardly changed. And they're about they're the same as they are in this model graph. I, I'm curious as to why these numbers are different, but they are. Uh, we can check our p-values, and both of these p-values are both they're actually even lower than they were before, um, confirming that you know this is the right analysis. Um, and because we're only applying two coefficients, when we calculate degrees of freedom to calculate our confidence bounds. Uh, we can actually use one additional degree of freedom um, because our original model had three values in it, the intercept, the slope for X, the coefficient for X squared, that's N minus three degrees of freedom. When we remove the intercept, we're left with N minus two degrees of freedom. And so um, we get a, um, a slight one additional degree of freedom available um, to sort of shrink that probability in the tails of our confidence intervals. But we have all of our computations that we need in our multiple regression output in order to perform any hypothesis testing or confidence interval calculations that we might like. And again, we can create our residual graphs for these. Now, I wanted to just briefly mention before we quit the adjusted R squared value. The adjusted R squared value takes into account the number of coefficients in the model. And um, essentially what it, it, it suggests is that there's a trade-off between, um, again, for parsimonious reasons, uh, you want to assess whether adding that additional variable to the problem is going to, um, uh, basically be offset by having the more complex model. Uh, and so it, that our adjusted R squared value calculates for the number of coefficients. And uh, here our adjusted R squared value is much smaller versus this one. Uh, and that actually kind of suggests that um, we might actually, that the R squared value in um, the graph that was again, a little bit smaller uh, is actually correct. And the R squared value for the full quadratic model might actually be better, but uh, it, it more explanatory. But 
this p-value for the intercept is contraindicating, it suggests that we really should delete it because it's not contributing in any way. We can't tell if it's different from zero. And so the null hypothesis is that in fact it is zero. And so we remove it. Uh, if you had set your, your significance level to point 0.1, however, you would, you would get to keep it. And so just like with multiple regression, sometimes you'll see some of these um, suggestions that maybe uh, things go one way or the other. Um, they're some sort of counterfactuals. Um, but uh, the, the whole idea here is that as our models become more complex, um, we sometimes have to make trade-offs in, in different, different ways. And we're not always necessarily going to get uh, everybody to come to the same conclusion. Complexity reads uncertainty. All right, so this is our full analysis of a polynomial model. And again, this is clearly not linear. We need some kind of nonlinear model and exponentials and logs and things like that, they're just not gonna cut it. And uh, we don't need to go to cubic or anything like that. We don't need to account for these little blips. Instead, we, we need to account for this big overall picture. And so a quadratic model is more than sufficient. And the way that we do that uh, to get our full data analysis tool pack analysis is we create a second variable for the power terms. If you're doing a cubic, you need to create the linear, the quadratic and the cubic generally speaking, unless you have, again, unless you have reason to eliminate one of the, the co coefficients. This is why we do this p-value analysis.